Good afternoon and welcome all members of the legal community, the Milwaukee Jewish Federation, and the greater Jewish and Milwaukee communities. A most warm welcome to our special guest for today's On the Issues with Mike Goucher, Judge Thomas Bergenthal. I am Mari Zimmerman, and I have the honor of co-chairing today's event with my friend and colleague, Lauren Blumenthal. We are both graduates of the George Washington University, where Judge Bergenthal taught for many years, and we are both proud alums of Marquette University Law School. We are grateful to our alma mater and our main sponsor, Marquette University Law School's On the Issues with Mike Goucher, for making Judge Bergenthal's appearance today possible. Thanks also to event co-sponsor, Boswell Books. Boswell will, will be selling Judge Bergenthal's book, A Lucky Child, a memoir of surviving Auschwitz as a young boy after his talk today. The Milwaukee Jewish Federation, or the Federation, or MJF, <laughs> is thrilled to be a co-sponsor of this event. Thanks to the Benjamin Cardozo Society and the Edie Edelman Political Awareness Endowment of the Jewish Community Foundation. The Benjamin Cardozo Society is a leadership coalition for attorneys with programming that integrates legal and Jewish concerns. The, so the society highlights the unique contributions the legal profession makes to improve not just Jewish communities, but broader communities as well. The Edie Edelman Political Awareness Endowment of the Jewish Community Foundation brings a distinguished speaker in politics or current affairs to our community each spring. The Edie Edelman Endowment was established by a special guest here today, Judge Lynn Edelman. <laughs> Judge Edelman established the endowment in memory of his mother, Edie Edelman. Because of Judge Edelman, he has made his mother's vision for women's political awareness and advocacy a sustained reality in the Milwaukee area. Lauren and I are graduates of the Milwaukee Jewish Federation's Weinstein Fellowship, a program that aims to inspire and cultivate leadership. And now we are board members of the Women's Philanthropy Division of the Federation. We believe the future of not just our Jewish community, but the broader community, rests upon the actions and advocacy of the next generation. Thank you, Mari. Both Mari and I are honored to represent Milwaukee Jewish Federation as co-chairs for today's event. For those of you who are not familiar with Jewish Federation, um, Milwaukee Jewish Federation is uh, the one organization that impacts every aspect of local and global Jewish life, providing human services not only for the Jewish community, but also for others in need throughout all of our communities and throughout the world. We celebrate Jewish experiences and strengthening Jewish community connections, and that has been going on for over 70 years. As a member of the Greater Milwaukee Community, the Federation also participates in the wider civic arena addressing general community needs and problem solving for people of all faiths by sustaining a network of local partner agencies, including community outreach and education and supporting social service agencies that serve all communities throughout the Greater Milwaukee area and beyond. Today's event certainly exemplifies the best of Milwaukee Jewish Federation. And we wanted to throw in our joke that this is the great coming together of the bench, the bar, and the bima. <laughs> and, and now we are pleased to invite uh, Dr. Andrea Schneider, professor of law here at Marquette University Law School and board chair of Milwaukee Jewish Federation to introduce Judge Bergenthal. Thanks. Thanks. There's nothing better than seeing your students grow up and lead an event. So I am already proud and delighted about this event uh, just to see you two in action. Uh, so thank you. I am really, truly honored to introduce Judge Bergenthal today. Thomas Bergenthal is the Lobinger Professor Emeritus of Comparative Law and Jurisprudence at the George Washington University Law School, where he has taught since 1989. 
I first met the judge in 1995 when I was a visiting professor at GW, and he has been a mentor and a friend since that time. I still fondly remember our lunches at the beginning of my teaching career uh, and all of his good advice. As soon as I landed here at Marquette, I wanted to invite Judge Bergenthal to speak. And in fact, we extended him an invitation pretty quickly in about 1999, 2000. Uh, but he claimed to be too busy at the time because he was just elected as the US judge on the International Court of Justice in The Hague, the Netherlands, where he served for a decade. I didn't believe him at the time, but. It sounded like a good excuse. He did come and present the Hallows Lecture here in 2005 to much acclaim, and we are delighted in a new building now to welcome him back. Uh, at the time, in 2005, we discussed how he was contemplating writing down the memoirs of his childhood, and I am so very delighted that he did finally put this into print, uh, and the book, entitled A Lucky Child, A Memoir of Surviving Auschwitz as a Young Boy, was published in 2009 with a foreword by Elie Wiesel. In one of the unluckiest stories in his book, his family was granted visas to leave Poland, they were dated September 1st, 1939. And when they showed up at the British consulate that morning, there were other things on the British consulate's plate, unfortunately. Instead, he spent his early childhood in various ghettos and camps and was one of the youngest survivors of Auschwitz and Sachsenhausen. Judge Bergenthal came to the United States at the age of 17. Considered now one of the world's leading international human rights experts. He is the author or co-author of more than a dozen books and numerous articles on international human rights. Prior to serving on the International Court of Justice, Professor Bergenthal was a judge and president of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. He served as a member of the United Nations Human Rights Committee, uh, the UN Truth Commission for El Salvador. He is now a member of the Ethics Commission of the International Olympic Committee and the honorary president of the Inter-American Institute of Human Rights in San Jose, Costa Rica. This is a brief summary of a bio, which is absolutely not doing it justice. Uh, but I know that you are much more interested in hearing from him directly. So with no further ado, it is truly my pleasure to welcome back to Marquette this remarkable man. Thank you. Thanks very much, Andrea, and thanks uh, to all of you for being with us today. Uh, based on the introduction that Andrea just gave the judge, uh, we will all be here till about 8, and uh, <laughs> it'll be a long conversation. We've got a lot to talk about, so uh, settle in for the evening. Uh, judge, it's great to have you here. It's Thanks good so to much. be here, and I, I'm sorry that we are proceeding. It would have been so nice to stop with that introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to begin, before we, we ask the judge a few questions, I wanted to begin by asking the audience a question. How many of you in this room have read this book, Lucky Child? I'm going to be very poor. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's a bestseller, isn't it? Well. <laughs> This is a, it's an amazingly powerful book, and I, I urge you to, uh, to read it. It will be available for sale. I'm not you know, out there encouraging you to spend money, but I'm saying if you're interested, this is just a very important and powerful book. And, and Judge, I wanted to begin there. Well, we'll spend a few minutes talking about this uh, because it shaped who you are today, obviously. Um, tell me what you hope to accomplish when you sat down to write the book, A Lucky Child. Well, I've, I've always known that I was going to write the book because I, first of all, for my children. And initially I thought of writing letters to my sons. And then the grandchildren came. Then I thought maybe letters to my grandchildren. <laughs> and I kept be, being busy and busy. Uh, I knew it, it had to be written. Um, I don't think I really intended it to be sort of more than something the family should know. It wasn't as a sort of propaganda or thing that, that really didn't interest me. I just wanted some place, a place where I could tell my story and people who were interested would read it. Uh, but I really didn't plan it as any sort of grand statement. You said you felt an, an obligation, though, yes. to tell your story. In what, yeah. in what sense? Uh, I, I thought I owed it to, to my family. Uh, I owed it to the people who, who didn't make it, uh, that their story would be told. And uh, that was particularly important to me. Um, and it made it a little difficult to write, because when you have that obligation on your back, uh, you, you write it differently than you write some other books 
And that was true here. What I, had the, what I was most worried about was to retain the voice of the child who experienced what is in the book. And what surprised me, we were just discussing it, that within about 10 minutes of my starting to write, the voice came back. It was no longer the voice of, a, of an old judge or a law professor, but the voice of a child who experienced this. And it, it just flowed. It was no effort at all. As a matter of fact, and I'm taking all your, no, your questions no. away. <laughs> Within about uh, three weeks, the main draft of the book was done. And then, of course, the revising and revising, that never ends, but it, it just came out. The passage of time, it took many years before you sat down to, to write this, this uh, book. Um, the passage of time changed what the book was and what it might have been, did it not? Was it in the sense that it might have been a very different book had you written it as a young man? Yes, it would have been very much so. It would have been a hate-filled book uh, and dealing, focusing on the suffering in a way that did not necessarily tell the whole story. Uh, so it, it, as it turned out, it was much better that I wrote it in my uh, late 60s uh, in, and, and could focus on really what I thought was important than focusing on things that, that I no longer was the person who, could, who wanted to tell the story of the suffering that really would not make the book readable to most people. I have to ask you about the title. and. Uh... You've talked about this on many occasions, but A Lucky Child is the name of this. Um, and I'm sure to a lot of us in this room, when you, when you read the book and you hear about a, a five-year-old boy who, with his parents, is on the run for the Nazis, and you hear about your experiences in Jewish ghettos in Poland, or labor camps, or Auschwitz, or the death march to Auschwitz, of witnessing unspeakable atrocities as a young boy, Lucky is probably not the word that would come to mind to most people in this room. But yet, I've heard you explain why you think that is a, the right word. Why is that? Well, uh, behind this title is my mother is being dragged by a friend to a fortune teller in Katowice, Poland, uh, where we were already on the run. And the uh, fortune teller tells my mother, uh, terrible things are going to happen to your family, which you really didn't have to be a fortune teller to know this in 1939. <laughs> and then she said, but you have a lucky child. But she said it in German. The German Glückskind is a little more than a lucky child, but I don't think in English we have the same word uh, that, that captures. A lucky child gets to it, but a Glückskind is a child that remains through life mm -hmm. with, with good fortune, but not necessarily financial, but a, a good a life. And I thought uh, that was really the way to honor my mother also, the, the lucky child, because she lived believing it. But she always said, no, no, I don't believe in this hocus pocus. But the fact is that after the war, when she survived and started looking for me, she always thought of the fortune teller. The fortune teller told her that I was a lucky child, and obviously a lucky child had to have survived the camp when everybody told her that children didn't make it. How did you make it? You, 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 in the book, I think you talk about the fact that, or maybe it was an interview I saw with you, you talked about the fact that, you know, even as a young boy, you can be remarkably resourceful and remarkably resilient. How did you? describe these near brushes with death on many, many occasions? Well, first of all, I, I had a father. My, my father was, was born in Polish Galicia, but he spent, he worked, uh, he studied law in Poland and then worked in Germany. And he really understood the Germans. And he was my best instructor what to do. He could guess roughly when the selection would come. To, when, all of, when, when they were looking for 
uh, people, sick people, children, old people to send to the gas chamber, he would invariably figure out roughly when that would happen and what to do. And he always told me where to stand, for example. They would do the select, they would do the counting, and then he said, you stand close to the back door as possible, and as soon as the count is gone, disappear in the barrack. And so he gave me those things uh, all along. Um, and, you know, I, I had one other advantage. And the advantage was I grew up in the camp. It wasn't like so many Jews who arrived in Auschwitz from a middle-class family background come to Auschwitz to a death camp and don't, didn't know, you know how, to, how to stay alive. I'd already had a few years of experience, uh, and that made a big difference. Uh, and starving even became easy. You get used to it, your body gets used to it. Children need less food than grown-ups. So all of this, I think, accounted for it. But I still think it was, in many instances, luck. For example, uh, the last time that my father and I were together, there was a selection, and, which we didn't expect. That was the only time he, didn't, he couldn't foresee it. And suddenly we were there in front of Meng Judge, uh, Dr. Mengele. And uh, I am pushed one way, meaning gas chamber, and he is pushed the other way. And then it turned out that the Germans did not have enough people to start the gas chamber. There were just 30 of us. So they postponed it. And uh, we were taken to an infirmary where we were supposed to be waiting for more people. And once I was there, a, a young Polish doctor saved my life by, uh, because on the back of our cards, uh, those of us who were supposed to die, they had put a red cross. And the Polish doctor tore up my card and wrote a new one without anything on the back. You saw, and you write about this in the book, despite the horrors and the atrocities that were happening around you, at certain moments you saw, I don't know if kindness is the right word, would that be the right word? Oh, yes. Humans, the good part of human nature, I suppose. Yeah. Yes, uh, and there were a number of instances. I, um, but, but that was, for example, one where you could immediately identify. Another instance, uh, this, a selection in the sort of last stages of, of the ghetto of Kelse, where we were, uh, the, the German police captain was standing here and then they would pull all the children out to be killed eventually in the Jewish cemetery in Kelse. And I come to him with my father, and I think it's my father who told me that, I don't remember, but I say to him in German, uh, Herr Hauptmann, ich kann arbeiten. Captain, I can work. And he looks at me and he said, well, let's see and let me live. Now what went through his mind? His son. His children, you know, some, a man who can allow 30, 40, 50 Jewish children to be executed, lets one live just because he speaks the same language he speaks, who knows, because he's human deep down. You say in the book, uh, Judge, that um, most, of, uh, most every day you were struggling to stay alive, trying to figure out a way to stay alive from hour to hour, from day to day. But there were moments where you did not think you would um, survive. And, but I was struck by the fact that you, you had sort of come to a peace in, in, in your own mind about that prospect. Yes, that was actually in the same, related to the story I was just uh, telling about being separated from my father. Th they put us into a separate barrack to await transport to the, to the gas chamber. And I escaped three times and I was caught three times. And at that point I figured that's the end. And I had this moment, which I've never had again in my life, of total acceptance of of death or what happened and figuring I, I tried my best and now I know what is going to happen and that was it.
uh, it was actually a very beautiful feeling of peace. And when you think of a child age 10 uh, having that feeling, I've never had that feeling before facing a lot of other difficulties. Uh, and it lasted just maybe, I, in my mind, I don't think it lasted more than two or three minutes because then the urge to, the desire to live ca came back. But during that moment, I figured that was the end and after three times trying and then being beaten every time they caught me, uh, that was it. You, uh, you mentioned that, uh, I don't want to say luck, but maybe that is the right word, that you, your, your family was able to stay together at least for, for parts of this. this um, until 1944. Yeah, yeah, until 1944. Uh, then your mother was separated from you and your father. Um, and then you also told us a story about when your father was separated during the selection. Um, you know a little bit more about all of that now today than you did probably when you even began writing the book. Yeah. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about that. Your father, you now found out, he, he was killed, he died. Um, shortly before the war ended. One month before. No, let me take that, no, sorry. He, he, he died in January of 1945. The war was over, really, April of 45. So three years, uh, three months, sorry. The story about your mother, though, I do want to spend a little time on because it is, for those of you who have read the book, it is a, that's a remarkable, heartwarming story after the war. And we could talk about some of your war experiences. He was a mascot in the Polish army. I liberated Berlin. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so afterwards you end up at a, a Jewish orphanage in, in Poland. And nobody really knows who made it, who didn't. But you're there for a while, and then all of a sudden you realize that your mother is alive. You hadn't seen your mother except for maybe five minutes for, what, two and a half years? Yes. How did she find you at a Jewish orphanage in Poland? Well, that's a complicated story. <laughs> uh, I end up in, the, in a Jewish orphanage in Poland, but an orphanage run by the Jewish Bund. Those of you who know the Jewish Bund, the Jewish Bund was really a very leftist Jewish organization that didn't believe that Jews should go to Israel, they should stay in Poland or wherever they lived to help build up. Uh, the country. Uh, but the orphanage was uh, infiltrated by a Zionist Jewish organization, Hashem or Hatzair. And one day the, the counselor who was, rep, who was there under false pretenses uh, came to me and said, uh, I had got to know her a little bit, she said, do you want to go to Palestine? It was, was still talking Palestine. And I figured, you know, I've been in so many other places, why not Palestine? <laughs> uh, so I said, yes. And uh, then I said, well, when can I go? I thought, and she said, no, you, you have to be the last one to escape. The, the procedure was that you would run away, and every, so, every few weeks or every month, another kid who wanted to go to Palestine would be told, now disappear. And so it meant really that you went two blocks down the street and you would be picked, picked up by a Zionist organization that would take you to Rome and then uh, to, to Palestine. And I said, well, I'd like to go. She said, no, you have to stay until the end because if you run, it'll blow the whole system because I was the only one in that orphanage had been in Auschwitz and, and Sachsenhausen and the press would interview me. So suddenly yeah, this one, I had a yeah. status. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was famous, supposedly. And so we waited. And there was some, and of course my mother was looking all over for me, all the search bureaus, and my uncle in the United States. And the one, and that happened, that a man in sitting at the Jewish Agency for Palestine, I don't know whether they were in, in Tel Aviv or in Jerusalem, looks at names. Here is a mother looking for a child and here's a child that is going to be on a list that's going to come to Palestine. And he puts it together and inform, informs the, the orphanage. 
Now, my, my wife's theory is right. Just imagine if my name had been Cohen or Levy or somebody else. He would never have put it together with, with a name like Bergenthal. There aren't that many around. So it, it stuck. And then uh, that, that's how she found me. And then initially, also, I get a letter from my mother written in Polish. And I said, that's not my mother, because I knew my mother didn't write Polish. Besides, the handwriting wasn't, because I knew my father always talked about my mother's handwriting as, the, as if a chicken had stepped into ink. <laughs> and so I remembered that. <laughs> and that was, that was much nicer handwriting than my mother had. So I said, now that somebody's trying to adopt me, because that was really in the orphanage what we were, in a sense, afraid of. And the next letter came, and it was my mother. And then I had to be smuggled out from Poland to Czechoslovakia to the American zone and, and Germany and then the British zone, my mother's hometown. You said it was hard to write about being reunited yeah. with your mother. I'd rather not. Rather not. Um, we it's, will say that it was wonderful. Yes, I should say I find, and I don't know, there are a number of you people here who are my age or a little younger. Uh, I've noticed that as I get older, certain things get harder for me to deal with than in the past when I thought I could talk about all of this without a tear in my eye. But it gets harder. I, you know, when I read this book, it, again, it, 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 the fact that you were so young going through all of these things, um, and then you see where you ended up going in life, Human rights law. Um, tell us about that that connection, because there is a connection, no doubt. Oh yes. No, I. First of all, it would, uh, I realized very early. At least this was my environment in in Europe, and in terms of our experience, that when people were being mistreated, they they looked. Unlike in the United States, where the tendency used to be, I don't know whether it still is, to look to the Supreme Court. Uh, in, uh, in other parts of the world, you always look to the outside. For example, I dreamed when I was, uh, my toes were, part of my, some of my toes were amputated in the last camp where I was because of the death march. I, when I was lying there in that hospital, I had this dream that the American bombers that were flying over the British, when I don't know which ones came at night and which one during the day, and they were all flying to Berlin because of where we were, would just drop a hook and take me to the United States or to England. Uh, so th that was always in my mind. And human rights to me meant you try to bring pressure on governments who mistreat people from the outside. And international human rights, that's what it is all about. Organizations, institutions that are intended to protect people in other countries who, whose rights are being abused by their own government or by other governments. And uh, I felt there, I really felt that I owed that obligation uh, to the people who died in the camp to work on, in this field. And I felt I knew something about that about the facts and the, so uh, it was natural that I should go to it. Although everybody is surprised to hear that my doctoral dissertation was on, the, on lawmaking in the International Civil Aviation Organization. <laughs> uh, and that came because my professor said to me, write about something in an international organization that doesn't deal with human rights and that you know nothing about. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the... <laughs> So Professor Schneider mentioned some of the, the many things you've done, but when we talk about the Inter-American Court of Human Rights or the International Court of Justice, these institutions, how important are they in the world today? What, what is their significance at this moment in time? Well, I've, I've always felt that if we'd had some of these institutions in the early 30s, that we could have saved a lot of people. This, and this despite all the criticism that, is, that one hears about these organizations, they still do save a lot of, li lot of lives. We had none of that in the 30s. When, during, when Hitler came to power, 
the U.S. couldn't intervene because that was a violation of international law. You know, intervention in the domestic relation of state was a basic rule of international law. That's a violation of international law if one state tells another state to stop killing people. That was the rule. And now it's a little different. Human rights today are no longer matters of only domestic concern. And there are organizations that are working on it. And uh, the politics around it develop. So I think they're doing a lot. They're not doing as nothing what is needed. Uh, but surprising in some places and some parts of the world, they are, they are quite successful. And we should support them. Uh, and uh, it's really, uh, one of my professors in, in law school said, it's really like building a wall, but you need one brick on top of the other. You can't just build it. And that's what's happening in the human rights field. And it's, uh, it's caught on, it's working, and it's failing like so many things in, in life, uh, but it has an impact. We could strengthen it, but it's, it's here, and over the years it's getting stronger. I, I want to explore that a bit further with you in, in a moment, but I, I do want to talk to you about something you were involved with, and uh, again, Professor Schneider mentioned this, but the, the UN uh, uh, Commission on Truth Commission for El Salvador. And the judge and I were talking about this upstairs. Um, this is really something that happened in the Central American nation back in the 1980s, terrible, terrible violence, um, uh, many, many deaths, um, and, uh, and probably culminated with the, the killings of, of Jesuits right. at the uh, university in uh, San Salvador. And so you're part of this Truth Commission. Give us a sense of what you hoped would come from that process and the difference it, it made for that nation. Well, the, the, the Truth Commission was established by the UN Security Council in cooperation with the guerrillas the, and the, the government of, of El Salvador. And it was a very brutal war, really. El Salvador is a small country. Lovely people, incidentally, uh, but they kept killing each other for a variety of reasons, and the, the killings of the Jesuits and the killing of uh, Archbishop Romero uh, were terrible crimes that were committed. And uh, in, in many ways, what I saw in El Salvador was worse than anything else I experienced after surviving the camp. It, it was what was going on there. The families divided by supposed ideology. Uh, and just a picture, maybe I mentioned the, the picture that I remember. We come into, we are supposed to investigate the important things that, crimes that were committed on both sides. What, we walk into the house where the Jesuit fathers were living and from where they were taken into the garden and executed. And as, I, as we come in, I see a portrait of Archbishop Romero, a large part, who had been ex killed uh, some years earlier, who had been a, really a proponent of peace and protection, with a bullet hole right through the, through the portrait in the, the heart. And this was done by the soldiers coming in to execute the Jesuit fathers. A Catholic country. And you look at this and it's destroyed. And you know why they were executed? Because the military officers who were basically doing that realized that if the Jesuits continued alive, at least that's what they thought, that they would make sure that a peace would be negotiated. And then what would happen is some of the military officers would end up what do you think they were worried about? Washing cars in Miami. So they didn't want to give up their life for washing cars in Miami. And that's why you have these wonderful people having to be, to be killed. Uh, well, we, we wrote a, a report. We, we were given six months. Actually, we could have taken 10 years to 
right? And we actually needed another three extra months to do it, describing what, what happened there. I think we solved the political problem. What we didn't solve is what is happening now in that country. Tremendous common crimes, terrible killings, for just uh, for money, just criminal activities going on. And it's been very hard. To, they don't seem to be able to control it. No way to foresee that, was it? No way to time? foresee it. What we did, that were, I think, in retrospect, where they, by the government and the guerrillas, I didn't think so. We recommended an important uh, employment program for the young people who were in the military and on the other side. When they gave up their weapons, there should be some social programs for them, some uh, work. All of the, none of that was really done. Instead, the political parties were just fighting each other in parliament, and that's the result. It's, it's very sad. Because, uh, uh, it would be very sad in any country, but I must say they're such lovely people, and, and they just, well, what's that to say? That was very hard for me uh, uh, to live through again. Uh, but I've, I, some people say that I've, I've Ex re try to re-experience my <laughs> experience. You mentioned about what these courts do, and, and uh, sometimes it works out very well, and sometimes maybe not so well. Let's talk a little bit about the world today and, and what you see in, in the world. I, I think of Syria right now, and I think of some of the images uh, judge uh, that we see. I mean, most of us in this room are probably familiar with the child's body that washed up on the beach, a refugee, or the little boy in the back of the ambulance covered in blood. Um, it seems like the world community should be doing more. Um, what is your take on, on what's happening there and, and whether there is anything the world community could do? Are you surprised we haven't acted in with greater collaboration in addressing that? Well, you know, I just came back uh, less than a week ago from Germany. Um, and in the talk, I, I was invited to speak before the German Society of, of International Law that celebrated its 100th anniversary of its existence. Although it was really not 100 years because uh, during the Nazi period, they were dissolved, so they couldn't. And I, I mentioned, among other things, that I realized that in Germany today, there's a lot of criticism of Angela Merkel. But I could see myself and the children, the refugee children, going through from one country to the next, trying to get in and not being allowed to get, get in. Uh, and she, I thought, showed the face of the best that Germany can produce. Uh, to me, that, that was a, a, an important lesson to see, that after all that happened in Germany, you now have a German prime minister who acts in a way a human being should act. And uh, I, I think that's, so I, there I see hope. We just need a few miracles uh, and a few people. Uh, you know, governments are governments. Politicians are politicians. Uh, one should never be surprised what, what they're doing. Uh, but I think we have institutions that to some extent uh, can create a better world. But we can't be too optimistic because we're going to be disappointed. Uh, so my, my sense always is uh, don't worry about how bad it is. Worry about what we can do to prevent some, some of it happening again. I, so I, I really don't even feel like, like saying what I think could be done. I just think it has to come uh, from people in those countries who, who have still a a soul uh, when they want to work. Because, you know, you cannot see what is happening in, in terms of the refugees, especially the children. I, that's where I'm most attracted to, without feeling we have to do something. 
uh, and the only one in many ways the country uh, that's been doing something is Germany. And then you see things that are terribly disappointing. Look at Hungary. How many Hungarians did the U.S. take in during that period in Hungary? And they are now acting they're the worst in terms of the refugees. That's why a little bit to lose hope. But I let, I let that sink in for only a minute, and then I decide we have to do something and shame them into doing more. <laughs> what do you think about what's happening in Europe right now in terms of we see some newer political parties that, that have, I guess I'll, I'll put it mildly, but a strain of anti-Semitism uh, ingrained within them. Um, does it concern you as someone who has experienced all that you've experienced in your life? Yes, but we, we should be careful in exa about exaggerating it. Uh, there is still, for example, the outcome in the election in the Netherlands is a very good sign, uh, very important. Uh, and the Dutch are very... I've lived in, in the Netherlands for 10 years, and in the only country that I've lived in, except when I came to the United States, I never felt like a foreigner in the Netherlands, which is really saying something for a country where you come in and have to do work, other work, but you feel this is very comfortable and they treat you like, as if you were a Dutchman. And, uh, I don't know. And I'm not sure how to put it, but I, I think we, it's important not to give up faith in a better future in what can be achieved, even if you, we see things happening that are terrible. Uh, because if we do, then there's not going to be any improvement at all. We'll just accept it. And the important thing is, is not to poo-poo the UN or some other international organization. You, you shouldn't be surprised that the UN acts the way to almost 200 states act. So the trick is to corral them into doing good instead of just playing politics. And they do some good and they do not so good. So I think uh, the trick is to just stay with it and fight and, and insist, uh, create more truth commissions, to create more international tribunals. And some of the tribunals that have been established, not only the International Criminal Court, which has some problems now, but smaller ones that uh, post uh, conflicts have done some very good work, which never appears in the newspapers. Most people don't even know these institutions existed, and they do a good job with governments collaborating. Sometimes they don't. I probably sound like somebody who sort of lives with whatever hits him. Uh, and that's true, because I think there's no other way to, to push in this area of human rights than to expect that things aren't going to work, go always the, the way you want to. But if you can just get it a little, get that one brick a little more. And I think we see that in many places. We don't see it in other places. I would not have expected anybody as courageous and humane as Mrs. Merkel to admit a million people after what well, we've, we've seen. Uh, and that, in a sense, has been the, the impact of education in Germany. Uh, Education, a seven year education for democracy, human rights. And it seems to have worked. It produced a miracle. And uh, we should work on that for our grandchildren. Start those, that type of education at the age of four. Not wait till they're in the university where they have all the prejudices that we all had. So, that's what I live with. <laughs> well, I was struck by something, and, and we'll take some audience questions here. I was struck by something in the book, and maybe we can kind of, this sort of takes us back to the beginning of the conversation, but I think you wrote in the book that you were terribly concerned, and this is a, a sort of a deep question that I'm sure you've pondered, but that you were terribly concerned that the people who committed atrocities were not sadists, but ordinary people who seem to live normal lives. That's a very scary thing. It is a very scary thing. Uh, I think it's true. I mean, there were some sadists, obviously, but not all of them. But careerists, 
people who go along, do what they are told, and then have excuses. Uh, to, to me, the, the question always is, why do some people maintain a moral sense, a moral direction, and others don't? What is it? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to it. Uh, all I know is that uh, there were Germans who did not commit those crimes, fewer than you would have hoped for at the time. And uh, there were Germans who committed some uh, terrible crimes. And I, have, I th always think of some of these murderers going home in the evening to their families, washing their hands, and then sitting down and teaching their children something. And how do you explain that? What is it in human nature that we can do that? I hope you know the answer. I don't. I do know that it's possible both ways. Uh, Tell us. I, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. No, no, I just said, I, you know, I've lived long enough and I'm still looking, trying to find it. I don't. Uh, but it, it's a reality. And that's why education, I think, early enough is so important. So before we came down here, uh, the judge mentioned to me that there's going to be a second volume of A Lucky Child? Yes. Well, I hope a different title. <laughs> <laughs> a lucky old man would be. <laughs> Wouldn't that be interesting? <laughs> but you're going to pick up from the time you arrived in America when you were? Yes, uh, I was 17 when I arrived in New York City. Uh, w the reason I'm doing that, I never thought I would do that. It, it, uh, it, it wasn't in my plans like the first book. Um, some of the, the, the book has now been published in uh, quite a number of countries, and some of, and including most recently in China, which came as a great surprise to me that, that there would be interest in China for, for this part of European history. Uh, the publisher of, of some of the Europeans uh, who published a book in Europe uh, wrote and to their, uh, wrote to me and, and to my agent that they'd received letters from people who said, well, Bergenthal arrived in the United States and now we know what, what he did until he got to the, what did he do after he got to, what happened to him? And uh, so I, thought I would give it a try. My wife said it's never going to work. Uh, and most of the time, if not all the time, she's right. <laughs> and which smart husband wouldn't admit that? <laughs> but then I started, and within the first few uh, pages, I realized it couldn't be written from A to Z. Uh, you know, I've lived too long, and imagine all of the things that happened in my life um, in the United States. So I decided to write about episodes in my life uh, that, I, that sort of were interesting and that affected my life. So that's what I'm doing now, in addition to coming here. Uh, and it's, it's going, it's, I, I find it interesting to, to relive some of the things that I'd really not thought about. You know, what do you think about when you have a life, early in my life, you thought about these events, they came back always. But my regular life never really did. So that's what I'm struggling with now. And I have about five chapters done, and it'll probably be many more. Uh, and I find some interesting things that happened to me over this period. <laughs> <laughs> you sound surprised. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> What I'd like to do is take a few questions from the audience. Um, for those of you who've been with us in the past, you know how this works. If you're in the seating bowl, you press down on the rim, not on the ball, but on the rim. Keep your finger down on the rim. We'll be able to hear your question. If you're in the back there, um, just raise your hand. Ryan has a microphone. He'll come over and hold the microphone. You can ask your question so we can all hear it. And we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. For And I think you should know I put on my hearing aid so I could hear you. He's ready. <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody has a question, please. Uh, Again. Yes, sir. To what extent did your faith uh, play uh, in your survival and during the course of your um, 
decarceration or an encampment, how many languages could you speak? About how many languages? During your uh, confinement in camp, how many languages were you able to speak at that time? Well, I, I grew up bilingual. German with my mother, Polish with my father. When we were together, we spoke German because my mother did not speak Polish. My father spoke Polish. And that helped. Uh, languages helped in the camp, especially in some situations, German, especially when you spoke German the way the Germans speak. Uh, and Polish uh, also made a difference in other situations when I was in the, in the Polish army. Uh, <laughs> so it, it was useful in different situations. Uh, of course, um, there were other languages. That today, I probably can identify a lot of languages without being able to speak them other than to understand. Uh, there was an influx of, of uh, Hungarian Jews, for example, to Auschwitz. And uh, one, as, a, as a child, and you automatically pick up some words and ask, what does it mean? I still know that Kitschi Kenyaret means a piece of bread. Those were the words one learned. Uh, but the two languages, Polish and, and German, uh, helped uh, immensely. If I'd been only Polish or German, it would have been more difficult. The other part of this question was about faith. Did faith play any role during your time in the camps? You know, when, when I was little, my mother always made sure that I prayed and thanked God for yeah. When I left camp, when I, I, today, I am not religious today at all. I'm very proud of being a Jew and having survived of, of the ethical part of, the, of Judaism. But I am not religious at all. And I should tell you that the re reason simply is that I would think, for me, it would be the ultimate in arrogance if I thought that a God let me live and let thousands and thousands of innocent children die. It's, I don't know the answer to that. And I just, as a result, can't see it. I regret it. I wish I could have, because I think f faith helps you deal with life in certain situations. But uh, I, I cannot claim it. You cannot imagine how many letters I get from readers who say, you say it was luck, but really. Uh, and, and I'm glad people believe that. It's, I don't. Other questions? Yes, hang on, we'll get you a microphone. You came to the United States at 17. Uh, what schooling did you have once you came at 17, and what prompted you to go to law school? Well, uh, I had no schooling at all until I was reunited with my mother in, 19, in December of 1946. I then had one year of private tutoring in Germany and attended school in Germany, high school, uh, two and a half years. I came to the United States and I had one of those very imaginative interviews in the school in Patterson, New Jersey. Uh, to this day, I think they, they were some wonderful educators. Instead of being given a test, which with my, that English would have been to some extent difficult, I, I was asked to meet with the heads of the department in Eastside High School in Patterson, New Jersey, about five or six of them, and they would talk to me for half an hour. And then they decided that I should be a second semester junior. And I, I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> Sounded good. <laughs> and then I was even able to graduate in, in uh, a year and a half. And then I, uh, then I applied to college. And wh what was interesting there was that I, I had a very good college uh, advisor in, in, in high school. And she said I should apply to 10 smaller schools so that I could really get activated to the United States. And she gave me a list of them. 
And uh, I, I applied to nine. Um, and the nine all wrote back and said that if after a year there, I proved that I could be academically qualified, they would give me a scholarship. Of course, I didn't have the money, but that wasn't a very great offer. <laughs> but there was, one, there was one college, Bethany College in West Virginia, that sent me the catalog that I applied for. And it's, the first line said, this is a Christian school, and then it went on. And I figured that they don't want me because I am Jewish. And so I didn't apply. And then one day, uh, I'm called to the counselor's office at the high school, and she introduces me to the dean of students of Bethany College. And he says, young man, why didn't you apply to Bethany? I didn't quite know how to say this. Uh, I finally said, I, th I thought that you really didn't want to admit a Jewish student. You wouldn't admit a Jewish student. Oh, young man, this is America. And I'll, you know, we'll arrange a scholarship and work and everything else. Uh, and just fill out the form. And within about a week, I had an admission letter with scholarship. And I spent a very useful, very wonderful four years in Bethany College and got, I think, as good an education as any place I could have gotten at the time. Uh, then I decided to, to go to, to law school. My, my father had studied law, and uh, my, my father and my mother always took the position that uh, law study doesn't necessarily mean that you need to practice law. It's a good education. Uh, at least that was sort of the German attitude that uh, it was a good general education to have a, have a law degree. And that was sort of initially my intention. Uh, I was then recommended for the Rhodes Scholarship by Bethany College. And I went to the interview, which was chaired by Milton Eisenhower, president's brother. And then they, it started out very nicely. And then they asked me, why do you want to go to England when you just arrived in the United States? <laughs> and I wasn't good enough to answer. I hadn't thought of that question. Obviously, it wasn't a wise interest. I then got a scholarship uh, to NYU. As I walked out of that interview for the Rhodes Scholarship, one of the members handed me a piece of paper and said, if you apply to uh, NYU, I'll be glad to write you a letter of recommendation. And I uh, then earned the, the Ruth Tilden Scholarship at, at NYU. Um, I then didn't seem to have enough education. Uh, I then decided to go to Harvard for an advanced degree in international law. And I received my master's in international law and doctorate in international law from the Harvard Law School. And here I am. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, hang on one second. It's a joy to have you here. Thank you. Um, two questions, and if you don't want to answer the first, you needn't, but I if would. You wouldn't mind doing them one at a time. I'm getting oh. old, and I'm not <laughs> sure I can remember the second question. OK. Um, how did your mother survive in the camp? Are you willing to answer that, or you'd rather not? Oh, yes, no. Uh, my mother survived Auschwitz. And she also had a wonderful experience. And it tells you a lot about my mother's creative genius. Uh, she, was, she marched down the line in front of Dr. Mengele, the, the angel of death of Auschwitz. And she had a thyroid condition. And he looked at her and he said, thyroid, and just ready. And my mother looked at him and said, doctor, you're a magnificent diagnostician. <laughs> and he let her live. Oh, amazing. The vanity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The other question was that I have for you is, what was it like to go back to Germany right after the war? Well, it wasn't easy in the beginning, because I would see in every one of them 
the ones I had met before. Uh, but I've been, uh, for a while, for quite a while, my mother still lived in Germany, and we would, she would either come to the US or I would go back to Germany. And every year there was a sort of slight, I sensed, a transformation of Germany. The first few years, it was always the same. Um, they still were, some of them came out of prison of war camps still wearing their old uniforms. It was, uh, it, it was not easy to, I mean, I was going to visit my mother and, and it wasn't easy for her to live in Germany, but it, she lived in her hometown. And can you imagine uh, when she first came to, back to her parents in Göttingen, which is a university town, in, in 1936, to show me off, uh, I was two years old, uh, her classmates crossed the street in order not to greet her in, in Germany. And when she came back, of course, they say, oh, Gerda, where have you been? I haven't seen you. For... So you can imagine how hard it was for her, but she had no place to go. Uh, and then she, she got a pension, and then she, uh, she remarried, and she moved to Italy. Uh, and then we tried to get her to come to the U.S., but she said, no, I, I, I know in America I have to work in a factory. <laughs> and that was because my uncle and aunt, when they came, had to work, and so she... Uh, but, of course, once the grandchildren came, it was very hard to keep her in Italy. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, you had your second question. Well, that was it. That was it. Oh, that was the second. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Yes, sir. I have a question uh, concerning applying international law locally. Um, since we're, at, at least as lawyers, we're, we're trained that uh, <coughs> next next to Constitution, international law is supposed to have the greatest force. Is there a way that we can use cite international treaties to local courts to get them to follow some of those treaties that the United States has signed? Oh yes. As a matter of fact, under, under U.S. law, a duly ratified treaty uh, takes precedence over uh, is of the same rank as the federal statutes. So you can invoke, and we in many instances invoke treaty law because it is basically, once it's been ratified, domestic law in that sense. It isn't, that isn't true in all countries. It is in some countries, uh, as a matter of fact, in some countries, a duly ratified treaty takes precedence over domestic law, all domestic law. That's true, for example, in Costa Rica and in quite a number of Latin American countries different parts. In other countries, uh, domestic constitutional law will prevail. So you have a different, different countries, different approaches to the domestic application of uh, international treaties. But under US law, it's quite, it's there. That's incidentally why it took the United States 25 years to ratify the Genocide Convention. Because some people, particularly in the South, didn't want to have a treaty on that subject. So, not all the things we do in this country are what they're supposed to be. Other questions? Going once? <laughs> oh, there's one way back here. And there's yeah. one here, too. <laughs> oh, okay. Go back here. My impression is that you're an only child. Did that have effect in your life? And I'm an only child, so say nice things about only children. <laughs> well, I, I should tell you that, uh, and I'm going to touch an area that's very hard for me. Mm -hmm. uh, when the ghetto of Kelse was liquidated, two of our neighbors pushed one of each of their children in my mother's hands and say, save them. And well, this is where I break down. I thought I would make it with this audience, that I would get through it. Well, uh, my mother were like siblings yes, to you. Yes, that's, you know, they, they were a little younger, the boy and the girl. And then they, in the next camp where we were, 
they fell to the to the selection and and died. So I I was alone, but emotionally I feel I lost two children, two brothers and sisters. Excuse me, but it's. it's Hi. Do you have any hope that the United Nations will ever be effective? Uh, Dr. Carl Kasowitz, long time ago, uh, worked for the United Nations and wrote several pieces. He escaped from uh, the Holocaust and wrote several pieces that he gave to me, and I would certainly like to give those to you because it was his way of trying to get us back on the track considering human rights and taking care of each other. And there are so many people right now that are so concerned that we are going the other way, that uh, humanity is, is having a real problem. We're not thinking of people as people. I can't say all I'm thinking is too, right. too much, because you remind me so much of a dear old friend of ours, Jacob L. Bernheim, who also escaped. The Another optimist. <laughs> because I should tell you, let me interrupt you. Senator Moynihan called me a goddamn idealist. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> I thought that was quite an honor. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but it, it was the right moment. <laughs> Talk too much, and I, I, I'm just not at all. I know your question is very serious, and uh, these are horrible times right now. There, there are times when we spend our lives trying to educate young people to think of each other and think of human rights, and we aren't. We're thinking of money and greed and power, and uh, many of us. We're very concerned what the future will be if the environment will survive. You know, God will take care of it, famine, uh, war, whatever. But that's not the way we as human beings should come. You are a true inspiration. I don't get the big head. You sound like my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and she actually came with me. And then she got, went down with a pneumonia and is in the, in the hotel, so. But I still hear her voice when I'm supposed to behave. So. <laughs> no, I, I think you're too pessimistic. Things are happening. They're not happening as fast as you and I would like it to happen. There's some bad things are happening too. But on the whole, uh, we're moving in the, slowly, too slowly, but, in many areas, the UN and some other organ international organizations, particularly regional human rights organizations, for example, the, the, an organization in the Council of Europe, which is the, the European Court of Human Rights, uh, the, in, in the Inter-American system, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, there's an Af African one now that is struggling. So things are happening, but not as, but this slowly, and so, we, we do more harm to these developments if we think they are not working. So the trick is to stay with it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap things up on an optimistic note. Um, before we go and before we say a thank you to uh, Judge Bergenthal, uh, I just encourage uh, the, those of you who are interested in these kinds of conversations, we've added a couple of more to our On the Issues website. You can check it out on our our website, law.marquette.edu, we just added a federal judge, Paul Watford, who will be here, um, taking part in a couple of activities at the law school. He was a, one of the three finalists for a Supreme Court nomination the, uh, that Merrick Garland got. Um, no, I'm just, I'm just going to leave it there. And, that, uh, and uh, also, uh, a Commissioner Emeritus of Baseball, Bud Selig, will be here. Uh, both of them will be coming up in early April. So check our schedule. Love to have you back. Uh, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to the Jewish Federation, to Andrea Schneider, to everybody here today. Hannah, it's great to see you. Uh, thanks so much for your interest and your attention. And most of all, thank you to the author of A Lucky Child, Judge Thomas Bergenthal. Thanks, thank you. Judge. Thank you. Thank you.